Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the latest Urban Living webinar. Uh, today's webinar is in conjunction with Commercial Acceleration, and we'll hear more about them shortly. And we are having a look at the uh, burgeoning later living market and specifically how to optimise later living sales rates. My name's George Sell. I'm editor of Urban Living News, and we are a multimedia platform uh, for B2B news and opinion from the living sector. Today's webinar is going to last an hour. We're going to have roughly a 45 minute Q&A with our panelists, and then we'll uh, save a bit of time at the end for some Q&A. So we'd like to make it really interactive. Um, we'd like to um, have your questions. So please submit them using the Q&A or the chat function in Zoom and we'll try and answer as many of those as we can. Everybody who's registered for the session will get a link to a recording of the webinar in the next couple of days. So to, just to give our discussion today a bit of context, here are some screen grabs of news stories that we've run on our Urban Living News site over the last few months, just to give you an idea of the sort of things that are going on. Um, Perhaps uh, the, the most telling one is, is um, top row in the middle, a report that said the, the, the shortfall in senior living accommodation has reached 600,000 units, which is a, a pretty staggering figure. Um, there are some um, project specific stories there. So, and, and there's a lot of investment come into this session. So there's a story about um, Audley signing a deal with investment partners, uh, Adlington securing some funding, um, Funding and investment is something that we'll, we'll get on to talk to a bit later on as well. Uh, and the bottom right story, um, perhaps slightly peripheral to today because it, it, it involves rentals, but it's one that really caught my eye and I think it's very intriguing. Uh, an intergenerational scheme that, that's just been launched in London where um, key workers and medical students will, will be living in the same development as uh, later living renters and sharing all the same facilities. So that might, might be an indication of, of uh, one of the directions that, that this sector is, is heading in. So as I mentioned earlier, this webinar is being delivered in partnership with Commercial Acceleration. And we're just gonna, gonna watch a quick video to find out more about what they do. Are you a later living operator or investor facing challenges with sluggish sales? Commercial Acceleration are experts in driving sales rates. With over a decade of expertise in the retirement and care sector, optimizing sales and marketing. Get in touch today. Okay, so now it's time to meet our speakers and you've seen the um... The, the virtual avatar there. Now it's time to meet the real Ali Pell. Um, morning, Ali. Welcome to you. And uh, tell us a bit about what you do. Hi, good morning, everyone. Yep. Nice to use an avatar and be able to sort of hide behind that sometimes. But um, yeah. Hi, my name is Ali Pell. I run a consultancy that specializes in speeding up sales rates so we can get more occupancy in the retirement, living and care sector. I also work in the hotel sector. And um, yeah, my speciality is is transformation and turnaround through sales and marketing. Great stuff. Thanks, Ali. Um, next, we have Lex. Good morning to you, Lex. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Lex Cumber, Sales and Marketing Director at Untold Living, formerly Ops Director at Arco, which is the trade body for the retirement living sector. Uh, I spent a fair amount of time in the States working with a sales specialist platform called Sherpa and have been involved in building them in a previous life. So uh, nearly, all for, uh, nearly all facets of the retirement living sector. Thank you, Lex. And Peter, welcome to you. Hello, everybody. Peter Robinson, uh, Director of Premature Research uh, in Europe. Um, we look and work with the financiers, the operators, the developers, uh, of uh, later living communities. As a company, we've been doing it for 40 years in the States, now in 11, 12 countries. Um, and we get into the detail of who is the customer, what do they really want, and what will they really pay for it, rather than perhaps what's just being offered from, uh, from some operators that haven't considered what the customer really wants 
but we'll get into that a bit later. Controversy beckons. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Thank you, Peter. Um, Derek, good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Derek Bringen, heading up the head, head the health and social care sector within Virgin Money. We also operate in the real estate um, aspects of health and social care, which includes Slater Living. Uh, we've financed four schemes to date and a sector we're very interested in. Thank you, Derek. And finally, Stuart, good morning to you. Thank you. Um, good morning, all. Um, I'm Stuart Moore. I'm a consultant at Lifecycle Living. Um, we are a consultant to look across all types of operational living. Um, and previous to that, I was at Retirement Village Group, and before that, I was at CRM Students. So I bring a slightly different slant to uh, today's uh, webinar. So I'm looking forward to it already. Thank you, Stuart. Um, if you look in the chat, you will see that the LinkedIn profiles for all our speakers have been posted there. So if you want to carry on the conversation after the webinar, then, then uh, please drop them a line via there. There's going to be quite a lot of information posted in the chat actually during the session. So we'll leave the webinar open for a couple of minutes at the end so you can take some notes from there. OK, let's get going. And um, Peter, I'm going to start with you. Um, so you're opportunity to be controversial has come around pretty quickly. Um, do developers of later living products, IRCs and so on, do they understand who the customer is? Does the customer understand what the product is? What, 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 what's, what's going right and what's going wrong? Sure, great question. Well, the fact that um, the, uh, the, the whole webinar is called Picking Up the Pace, How to Avoid Sluggish Sales, is the elephant in the room for the sector, isn't it? Because there aren't enough sales made monthly to hit um, the targets that uh, a lot of operators have obligated themselves with, you know, baked into the cash flow. The financial director is expecting sales, uh, and you know, they're not happening um, at the rate that many operators would like them to be. And that's across the board. And for those of us on this call um, where we know each other and we've spoken about this many times you know it's been going on for years and years does this mean that um, the general public the potential residents don't want to live in them no I don't believe so uh, I think that's a separate challenge of uh, people understanding what they want out of life later life um, and there's a lot of misconception and misunderstanding about what IRCs integrated retirement communities bring but where you've got a more fundamental problem is that the people component, the residential component, who's going to live in these IRCs is not considered until too late in the internal planning process, small p, and that capital structures and a desire to create luxury and uh, overburden the site with a lot of cost, which is then or has to be passed on in a purchase price or a rental and a monthly fee and a DMF becomes too um, too distracting and too narrow in its appeal to that market. And actually what we do is engage, if we are fortunate enough to be engaged early enough in the process, um, we can find out through what we call community planning research seminars, a very soft marketing approach is to meet with those potential residents and get very robust quantitative data about what it is they really want and crucially what they will really pay for it because we see often a mismatch between what has has to be baked into a price for residents and the potential residents aren't willing to buy at that price hmm. so uh, i'll stop there because that's quite a, a monologue <laughs> Does this mean, Peter, that there is kind of insufficient thought given to tailoring developments for their specific location and target market and perhaps yeah. there's too much gen generic development going on? Yeah, there is. Um, we know because we've done countless um, of, of these community planning research seminars, as it were, a key face to face event to meet potential residents that uh, even in, within the same groups, because we've we've done work for many groups in the UK, and mainly mainly capital in Europe um, is that they they do vary and not just by the obvious sense of one is a wealthier town and the other is a poorer town for want of a phrase, but that that how people want to live varies by region and that you really do need to throw a net around a particular area 
and, and get into the nitty gritty of what people want and what they'll pay for it. And aside from the, the kind of location related specifics, what do, what do people want? What are the what are the what are the absolute essentials that that any development um, needs to have? What what are the kind of frameworks that you should start and, and build out? Yeah, the, the, there isn't there isn't a simple answer in terms of listing amenities and services. I mean that that's just you know that that that's not possible. What what you've got to start with is thinking how can you create a place that people are happy to leave their own home and move into so they can live as if they're still in their own home. And that varies for so many people. And they don't always know what they want. Um, they, you know, they don't want to talk about care homes. Their friends might talk about care homes. And that's a whole different ballpark and not aspirational. I've got a, uh, I met with Ali a, a couple of weeks ago and um, I can see why she's such a busy lady because there's a lot of remedial work to be done out there. If I've got a point before I just hand off, is that the marketing of these developments comes along to push a product, and actually uh, into a, into a sales scenario. But you've got to back up from that. For marketing, you should be engaging with the community, call them partnership managers, call them whatever you want, community outreach. Um, but before that, you almost need to do counselling with people. Um, I have found myself counselling potential residents of client um, uh, sites because they've come to engage through us as a research company to find out what is this all about? You know, tell us what are our options in life and you start engaging with them and you are actually counselling them. So you need a counselling and engagement, then marketing, then sales. And I think where we're lacking uh, and have a sluggish sales situation is because uh, operators are not engaging early enough in the planning process, small p, uh, and turning on marketing as if they're selling property uh, when the site office is open and they've recruited people. That's too late. That's too late to hit those sales targets in the first quarter of opening. You have to be engaging and creating clients much, much, much earlier, a year or two earlier, because of the lack of knowledge and understanding about what IRCs are. Okay, thanks, Peter. One one last quick question for you: How widely does the target market vary from one location to another? Obviously, there's income to factor into it, but do you get broad discrepancies in terms of uh, in terms of age, in terms of family situations? Is it is is it a very broad selection? Or no, is it... I, I, we we did some research for Arco back in 2019. I co-wrote a report on this. Um, and we we interviewed residents and prospects at I think eighty four different Arco sites around oh what sorry Arco member sites around the UK. The average age of a person in an IRC is eighty two point eight years. It's eighty three in the states, so it's pretty much um, nailed on. But that means, of course, there's people who are in their early sixties, and it means there are people in their nineties. So there is a great range um, of of people. So, um, yeah, you've got to be site specific about that, George, I think. Yeah. OK, thanks, Peter. Um, Lex, I'd like to move on to you now and, and let's let's pick up and, and develop a bit this this piece about community outreach. So what is best practice for, for operators and marketers to to reach their potential customers and, and indeed their families? Because this is not a, a straightforward sales process just to one person is more complicated in that so what what should people be doing and when should they start the process yeah and then okay i'll ask that before i do that i'll just sort of just drift back momentarily to that bit about you know what do customers want mm. i'm kind of with henry ford on this if i've given customers what they wanted i would have sold them a faster horse customers don't actually know what they want and if you look at the diffusion of innovation curve and all those things early adopters, early majority, you know, this is a product that eventually will take off, but we're at the very early stages of customers understanding the product. So that's an aside. Um, with regards, how do we reach users and their families? I suppose, you know, there's, there's a couple of ways of looking at this. First of all, there's the traditional marketing routes, whether it's letter drops, direct marketing, you know, websites, actually, most people do actually find um, uh, access to and uh, start engagement with sales teams through decent websites, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. 99 times out of 100, there is a problem. 
nobody accidentally logs on to a IRC website or looks up retirement living in the same way. I don't accidentally one morning think, oh, I think I'll look up divorce lawyers this morning. It doesn't, it doesn't happen. There's always something in the background. Uh, that drives someone to to look up retirement living in a web on, on in Google or whatever the case may be. Um, so I think I think that's one way of looking at it. I think the second part to that answer is actually by getting up off our backsides and going out there. And I think that speaks to the whole kind of community outreach. Our customers are out there. They are not in our sales cabins. They are not in our sales suites. The job of a, of, a, of, a, of a good sales and marketing team, uh, obviously the marketing team's got to kind of try and fill the funnel and, and raise awareness out there. But the sales team, and I want to make a, dis, a dis, we don't have a marketing problem in this country. We have a sales problem. We're experts at marketing, but this is a product uh, particularly later living or the integrated retirement community model, which again, most people don't, can't distinguish between that and retirement housing. Um, um, it, it, it's it, it's a it's it's a product that fundamentally nobody really wants. They might need it, but they don't want it. Nobody wants to move out of their family home that they've been living in for 50, 60 years more. In some cases, I was talking to an operator the other day who's just had a resident moved in who was born in the house she's just moved out of. Did she want to move out of it? Absolutely not. Did she need to? Yes, of course she did. Um, and that's why she ended up moving. And that was, as Peter rightly uh, spoke to earlier, was there's a strong element of counselling. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it's, a, it, it's a complicated answer to a relatively simple question. Lex, you, you mentioned that um, a good website is a starting point. I, I, is the industry guilty of perhaps underestimating the, the digital fluency, for want of a better term, of, of, of this um, end user? demographic i mean we've had webinars before about student housing and co-living and they're doing a lot of marketing to their clients through social media and so on is that something that this mm. sector is 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 capitalizing on yet i think it, i think it varies i mean i think we're always very confused as to who we're talking to or, 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 with a web presence are we talking to adult children because very often they're the gateway to the conversation very often it's i'm worried about mum so I'm going to have a look. Uh, and that's that's a completely different conversation. Well, no, we're not completely, but it is a different conversation to the one that you might be having with someone who's looking for themselves. So I think this kind of this general, the customer, who is the customer? Well, they're all individuals. So you need to be very, very um, focused on, in my opinion, filtering out people. I think a lot, a lot, of, a lot of kind of marketing is, it works on the assumption uh, that volume is good. Uh, certainly uh, here at Untold, we are of the opinion that volume is bad. We do not want volume, but we, we don't want quantity. We want quality. So, so our website is literally going to be filtering people out. We will be saying, you know, through various uh, processes on, on our website, actually, our product's not right for you. Yeah. You know, that's fine. It might be later, but, but thanks. But, no, you know, we're going to tell you, no, don't come to Untold. We're not the right product for you. We're seeking our minimum viable market, not our maximum. Judging on recent experiences I've had, if I said out loud, I'm a bit worried about mum and where she's going to live, I'd have adverts for retirement properties on my social feeds within about half an hour. That seems that seems to be <laughs> how, sophisticated, uh, how sophisticated it is at the moment. Um, sticking with you, Lex, um, we've had a question here from Gene O'Donovan who says, would you agree that potential customers can be researching their next home for some time before they even engage with the sales process? What do you think should happen during that time of decision making? I think as an organization, you need to do a number of things. You need to be consistent in your messaging. You need to be very consistent about who your product is for and who your product is not for. And in very basic terms, you need to show up for the customer. So for us, uh, I'm told uh, it's a case of we'd like to come and meet you. You know, the website's all very well. But really, the only meaningful conversations start happening when it's face to face. Now, that requires resource and that requires time and that requires expense uh, and cost. Uh, but again, if, if quality, not quantity, is, 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 is your core focus, which fundamentally, I think, is, is what we as a, as a sector need to shift to, uh, then, then I think, I think it's, it's time and money well spent. Yeah. OK, thanks, Lex. Um, 
Ali, let, let's move on to you and 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 talk a bit more about the actual sales process. Um, how long does a typical sales take? A typical sale take in this market because it's a it's a, it's a complicated process compared with many other even other real estate um, sales transactions. Yeah, thank you. And I, and I think it would be a good point to distinguish as we're touching on here between some of the different um, differences between um, an IRC versus a care home versus a retirement housing. And on the ARCO um, website, they've got a very useful table um, on their front page, which which breaks it up into those three different categories of retirement housing um, versus IRCs, where we've mostly um, been focusing on more today and then care homes. So if we um, talk about the average length of sales cycle, I want to be more specific with which category we're talking about. So there has been some research by, um, I, I believe, Sherpa to look at the, the length of sale from uh, the, the first moment in terms of an inquiry to the actual move in. And I understand for the IRC, it's about 254 days, whereas for a uh, the care home is much more quicker, like nine, 92 days. And, and the reason for that is what we've been touching on so far is because it's a, a, a more complicated, emotional, aspirational cell, the IRCs, that people are thinking about and deliberating and then asking their daughter and their son and their friend and their financial advisor and everyone, um, having multiple visits, multiple calls, um, whereas, on the care, care home part, it can be more um, a, a need driven, something has happened, such as, um, you know, having a fall or, 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 or something that, that more drives the pace. And we, we've mentioned that adult children play a crucial role in the decision making process. So how how does the sales team um, tailor its approach to to reassure them and the and the end user and how, you know what, what what's the difference in 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 the way you speak to those two different groups yeah I, I think it's it's critical to speak to the right group of people in the right way you, you know it's it's all about um individualization as we've talked about using the right messages the right um the right images so in an IRC, your primary target audience could be the actual end user themselves, which, as Peter was saying, might be an 82 year old. Um, and, and there it might be more, more about their pain points and their motivations for moving in this very um, life changing emotional um, situation. Whereas the secondary target audience might be more of the influencers like, like us on the call today, who's more the daughter or the um sign or you know trying to to influence so you would use you would use different messaging there and and it, I, I would say I know I know you just said sales but but that's definitely a sales and and marketing thing working together there because marketing also need to you know create create the right um collateral or digital assets to to be able to to provide to the sales team so so they can be on point um Peter you've got your hand up did you want to come in on that quickly yeah, just a quick one. I think it's very hard for sales to do its job a lot of the time in IRCs because what they're given is something that's been created by the, the financial modelling team for the development, which involves the widely not understood DMF or deferred management fee model, which is about capital return uh, and the capital structures that they need to pay, pay down in effect within the, the group. And that those salespeople don't always explain DMF well. I know because I've had to explain it in lots of different ways at lots of different research seminars, but people just don't get it. So I think sales is hampered by a misunderstanding and, and the sheer complexity of, of some of the products they're given to sell. Yeah, okay. thanks, Peter. Um, Ali, we, we um, alluded to that when we were looking at the slides earlier that the rental model is um is becoming more prevalent is the kind of try before you buy concept of, of, of renting a unit before you see to buy you, you decide to buy it is, is that taking off and, and is that something you can see growing uh yes i can see it growing you know i'm always looking at different operators and i'm on most of their um email um newsletter lists or something to know to know what's coming out and and yeah i am seeing 
more, try before you buy. Um, from someone who's um, specializing in sales and marketing like me, I, I prefer to have a choice of, of tenors, um, whether that's sale or rental or, you know, some operators got five or six things. So it's more just what's right for the customer's financial situation. And we'll just try to work through the right solution because it's just about customer choice. Um, but yeah, one one big point that you're making is we've got lots of statistics to show that the rental model is is growing. You, you have operators like Birch Grove or Range for that that just are pure play in, in those um, models. But then you have others which which offer a hybrid, which which um, you know is is wonderful from a customer point point of view. And and the rental point um, and what we're saying here about I mean the try before you buy. It could be a one night. It could be two nights. It could be a week or a, a month, it's an excellent way to give people a taste of what the um, actual experience, the environment of this lifestyle would be. So I, I would always love to have that as a sales tool up my hand to have a proper experience. So like a um, a show apartment that that's that that's 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 really um, you know enticing for people versus sometimes operators just have a guest suite. I, I would go for the the show apartment. And at a time where they can experience events and talk to the actual residents to get a taste of of how wonderful this is. Mm -hmm. um, Stuart, am I right in thinking that you had rental and sales units at, at retirement villages and, and were the rental? Did you see a good conversion from renters who went on to buy? Yeah, very much so. So I think something we haven't talked about in detail so far is about the CNIRC. So I think the community begets community. It's very difficult to sell until that community exists. The same problem exists in co-living, in student, et cetera, et cetera, because there isn't that, <clears throat> that yeast, that starter at the very beginning. So what we found is that a rent before you buy, so you had a, a year to complete, so you could rent there. We gave six months rent free. Um, people would convert, and we never had anybody drop out because it is a chance to experience that community. Um, and I think that is currently the difference. And, and Lex has talked about it and Pete's talked about it. They talked about need. At the moment in the UK, we are still a product that is needs led. And actually it needs to be want led. And that is part of the issue with it, that, that we as an industry are, are, are perpetuating because we are not communicating well enough, and, and, and the guys have mentioned this previously, we're not communicating well enough actually what this is. We're not communicating well enough what the benefits are, and therefore we're not positioning it correctly. So I'm doing some work at the moment for, a, a, some, uh, for, for some money that's looking to come into the market, and <clears throat> overwhelmingly, nobody knows what this is. Overwhelmingly, nobody knows what this product is. Overwhelmingly, the names of Max Stone, of Churchill and uh, and Beach would come up way, way, way before anybody else in the sector. And as a result, um, we are, as an IRC group, we are we are struggling to, to be recognised. Having said all of that, the product of the age-restricted housing, retirement housing, if you will, or to be, but age restricted housing to be more precise is really a case of it's a very low entry price you know you start to look at that and it's sub 200,000 for an apartment um peter talked about you know what does it take and you asked him george about what does it take to be a um an irc does it matter from location to location in reality i i don't think it does there are a number of things that have to be there for it to be an IRC and then fall under ARCO. You've got to have a beast, you know, you've got to have an F and B offering, you've got to have a lounge. Then everything else is justifying the build price. At the moment, just to put it into, and I'm sure Derek's going to come in and talk about money in a moment, but to put it into context, we are building in the UK currently at about 320 pounds a square foot. Great. Everybody says that's fantastic, but you still got to make a profit. You still got land in there. You still got everything else in there. So you're really selling. No, you know, if you're profitable, and obviously there are providers that aren't, and therefore their cost is more affordable. We can get into that in a moment. But ultimately, you're selling at about 500, 550 pounds a square foot. 
which equivalents to about half a million for a two bedroom apartment. There aren't that many people outside the southeast of the country that want to buy a two bedroom apartment at 500,000 pounds. And then to Peter's point is you have to justify that. You have to justify that with a gym. You have to justify that with all of these other facilities, which in reality only cost, I know this sounds an odd description, only cost two apartments. So a pool may cost a million, but that's only two apartments. So that that the, the, there's a chicken and egg process because of the cost of construction, the cost of land, the cost of getting it through planning and all of this sort of malarkey it means that we're becoming very expensive and I think that's an issue that we, we need to address. I think there's an issue around the confusion between IRCs and age-restricted housing and what the benefits of both are to different audiences. Um, and to, to Ali's point, that tenure agnostic programme, that, that rental, that rent to buy, that part ownership, still hasn't succeeded to fully th flow through our, our market. And again, yeah. it's understanding. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. I'll come back to you in a minute. I want to go back mm. to Ali for a couple of questions first. Um, Ali, Stuart mentioned that the age-restricted housing there, as opposed to IRCs, are IOCs starting to see the same issues that crop up in age-restricting housing, at, as in your sales team is competing with resales? And how how is that process managed? And how does it potentially muddy the waters? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's different um, structures going on in terms of resourcing that some have, you know, se separate teams where you could say, you could say, are they competing or some? It, it's just the, the same team doing both. So um, I, I think the bigger issue that I more come across is um, a, a lack of efficiency in the customer journey from handling the sales in the first place, whether it's resale or sales. Um, there were some shocking statistics that came out the other day about like 70% um, of inquiries don't get handled, you know, so like missing phone calls, missing emails, just just terrible. It kills me. Um, and, and, and it was talking about the key times when our customers might be ringing us like a Friday night or weekend where we're not putting the right resources or you know tools in in place to to take those efficiently so that that's a lot of my um attention usually is is on that part just how do you make sure you capture a sales or a resale and and sometimes some of the operators in in both those categories you're talking to then even complicate it further by having something where it's another person who then triage it to another who's then on holiday and yeah is this um a symptom of the fact that demand is so much greater than supply that the salespeople are, are absolutely swamped or is it because operators aren't employing the right salespeople or is it a bit of both yeah i mean that, that that that's a big question isn't it that we could talk for um five hours about i i think to the point of this demand um outstrip i mean we have got a great uh tailwinds coming up and it's it's when is the demand um, wanting to be heard, you know, to the point of if it's if it's that Friday at seven till ten or weekends, how do we resource up to that? You know, having people on the phones to deal with that, having show rounds that you can do on on the weekends, having other tools like live chat and um, you know where 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 you can keep twenty four seven responding to people if you want. The point on sales team, I obviously do a lot of um, sales teams training. Um, still, unfortunately, I come across a lot of sales team who who are selling real estate. It's like some property transaction where it's it's really. I mean, we've we've used words like a counselling approach and consultative. It's a very skilled um, sales team that is is needed. You're selling something. I think Lex said it's something that people don't want. It's not sexy like a Lamborghini or something. It's a very difficult sale. So that that way of really knowing how expertly to nurture a customer right from the discovery call to the tour and sell like a dream and a lifestyle that that's a whole skill in itself and, and then follow up efficiently as there's another area where we drop the ball all the time that that's proper just sales professionalism and and many times unfortunately we, we're just not at the required level mm. it's, it's definitely a skill when as you, as you say it's it's not a 
it's not a product that people want generally it's a people it's a product that they need at, at this stage in the market's evolution lex did you want to come in and comment on that yeah just, just to sort of back some of what ali just set up um i think i think there is a massive problem with sales in the uk we start too late uh there isn't a professional sales culture in the uk showing people around and someone around an apartment is not selling certainly not in this sector it is in general needs housing or you know or other kind of property types because generally people generally speaking people want it you know student accommodation i've got to move to this town i need accommodation it's again like but it's easy to sell you're selling water in the desert what we're what we're doing is selling cold drinks in the in in the snow and ice i've got some i've got, I've got some sort of data uh which is actually a piece of work that sherpa conducted with Promatura. actually this is in, in the states um, and just very, very briefly, briefly, I'll run through it because it's quite surprising. Uh, so this is back in 2017. Uh, the sample size is pretty large. It's 23 and a half thousand uh, people who had purchased in integrated retirement communities. Um, it's based on uh, surveys with 502 uh, salespeople, 41 different communities, high end, low end, mid market, super ultra posh, East Coast, West Coast, all over the states. Uh, and it was uh, 302,159 sales interactions took part. Surprise, surprise, 9% of the purchasing decision is based on the property. 9% uh, on features and amenities. 25% uh, of the purchasing decision is driven by emotion. 21% driven by the sales process and the way it's specifically designed to the individual. 18% is based on trust. So there you go. Already, the vast majority of the sale is based on how do they feel about your team, about your company culture, about the people that they're dealing with. Then it's uh, unique value, 14% of the purchasing decision, which is price. And is it in the right town next to my grandchildren? Basically, things that are outside your control as a sales team, you either can or can't afford it after all. And then finally, sort of 8% is based on how sales teams follow up. And 5% is based on on uh, the kind of the logistics of the mood, of the move, I should say. But the point I wanna kind of ram home here is that 9% of the purchasing decision is based on the property. If you think about that for a minute, that is mind blowing. Think about where we focus our efforts and energy in terms of marketing and sales. I tell you what, it's a lot more than 9% of our efforts are focused on the property, I would say we probably put 90% of our efforts into the property, the lifestyle, the jazz hands. We're, fo we're focusing on the wrong part of the problem here. This is a people business, and we need to start employing sales teams who focus on people, not property. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Thank you, Lex. Peter, you've got your hand up as well. Yeah, obviously, completely agree with everything Lex has just said about that. I did, um, I did six months uh, uh, consultancy with Autumna last year. If you know the Autumna website, Debbie Harris, it's, um, it's a, an advisory platform. It's something that for free, you can call up as a, an elder daughter in distress about a mother that, that needs to move on and so on and so forth. And what's interesting is the difference between the counselling and the consultation you get through bringing up an autumnal helpline where you've got people with backgrounds and experience with the NHS, customer relations for airlines, uh, social workers. So these, and I've, I listened in to many a phone call because I wanted to understand what that first contact looked like for someone that was either looking for themselves or looking for a, an aged parent uh, or not so aged parent. And I contrasted what I heard about the engagement and the need for information with then working directly with marketing and sales teams from a research perspective in what was going to be the handover process. So imagine you've called for the information through Autumna, you've got all this lovely information and, you know, how do I do this? How do I do that? And then you'll hand it over to someone that just has a product with a diehard, I sell property mentality, why don't you come down? And then it's rat -a -ta, ta ta And that that just doesn't work. And, and um, you know, is it the fault of sales teams? Is it the fault of the, the people that employ these sales teams? Probably not. 
because there isn't a huge group of people of successful salespeople in the IRC sector to recruit from. But it does mean that those that we hire or, or are hired in sales need to be retrained and rethought and reprogrammed <laughs> for want of a better way of thinking. And it all needs to happen much, much, much sooner before marketing even gets to talk to these people. Anyway, enough. Thank you, Peter. Um, Stuart, I want to come back to you for a minute. You, you mentioned earlier that um, sat, you know, in the southeast of the country for an apartment, you, you're looking at um, upwards of half a million quid. Is the industry doing enough to provide lower to mid price point accommodation or is it too focused on, on the um, upper mid scale and, and upper price points? It, it, it's, it's naturally focused there. We're seeing it in all other living sectors. We're seeing it in residential, we're seeing it in single family home, we're seeing it in built to rent, we're seeing it in co-living, we're seeing it in student in particular, all of which are pushing up the value chain. The average price, and, and you know, let's talk about selling, you know, selling water in deserts, PBS saying, no, it isn't. You're paying £330 a week for some. In London, you're paying £700 a week. The average price of a PBSA unit in the UK is now £205 a week. That is a difficult sell. What, what we've got at the moment is we have got an untapped audience outside, outside the southeast of the UK. We've got the central belt in Scotland. We've got the northeast. We've got the northwest. We've got exceptionally large houses and homes in, in and around South Manchester, in Cheshire, in Warwickshire. All of these places have an audience that is desperate to get engaged with us. But at the moment, we have a product which is, I would argue, too large. You start to, if you start to think my half a million pound apartment is 75, 80, 90 square meters, why aren't we doing something and being innovative and looking at something at 40 or 50 square meters, which would bring the price down. Look at Mayfield in, in Watford, smaller rooms, only one en suite, only one bathroom, beg your pardon. Still got a swimming pool, still got this. They were selling at four units a month. The average IRC is about two, maybe 2.25 a month. So again, is it to do with price? Is it to do with product? Is it to do with location? Rolls-Royce sells 6,000 cars a year. Their average price that they sell for is about half a million. There's a lot of people that can afford Rolls-Royce, but there's only a few that want it. We keep talking about need. You asked me earlier, George, about the people that come to our village and, and rent and then go on to buy. Nobody's talked about the sales team that has actually the existing residents. That, that's the sales team. That's the most important sales tool you have in your armory. Um, they, you know, they change that I need to I want. Mm. And I think that's, that's, that's huge. That's actually my next question that. for you, for you, Stuart, which is how much of a role does word of mouth recommendations and testimonials play in this whole sales process? Incredibly much so. Incredibly much so. The, the, the worst residence experience we've ever had are those that are transplanted from their home to be near their children's home. And the reason for that is they are completely starting afresh. Then they've got to check, find a new women's institute. They've got to find a new golf club. They've got to find a new bowling club. They've got to figure out how to get around and go shopping and all of this. The ones that are most successful are the ones where people are moving closer or, or sorry, big pardon, in the same locality but it, within reasonable driving distance where they can still maintain their existing connections with people. We could, we, you know, Lex had just said it. Very limited things are about the real estate. It's about the people. So why would we, why do children insist on picking up their family and dropping them near where they are because of this need, this perceived need? We want people to want to live with us. As soon as that community, that existing community that, that is in, within these IRCs can say, you'd really want to live here. It's brilliant because of X, Y, and Z. And they get to experience X, Y, and Z over their time that they're renting or they're trying, as Ali said, they're trying before they buy. The sale's done. The sale's done. You, you know, it doesn't need a salesperson. All they have to do is sort out the finance. It's about the existence and about the experience of living there. And that word of mouth is, is worth everything. It's worth absolutely everything. Yeah. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Stuart. Um, Derek, you've been very patient. I'm going to come come on to you now. Um, how strong is investor and lender sentiment towards this sector currently? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think it, it's such a niche area of of UK real estate that it does require a lot of focus and education. Um, I spent a long time with colleagues in ARCO understanding the market. Uh, and I think, I don't think it's for the faint hearted if you're, if you're a lending institution just to walk into this without that visibility of just exactly what an IRC is. And um, so I don't, I don't think it's, it's, a, it's an open playing field for lenders. We have seen quite a lot of institutional money coming into the sector with long-term investment, um, but probably less so from your more traditional high street um, banking fraternity. I think Lex and Stuart have expressed some of the areas which do cause some focus in terms of your risk. And that that's really where um, there's a lot more education required. There's a lot of good work been done. Uh, as I say, we we finance four schemes. I, I would I would agree with um, Stuart that they've been in affluent areas. They've been predominantly in the south. They have been sub one hundred units as well in terms of scale, and three of them have actually been co located alongside a brand new care home to complement the site. So there's a bit of there's a bit of a risk share there as well. Um, so I think it's I think it's just it's something we're going to have to keep working on to improve the visibility and the understanding of of the risks and the market itself. The um, the discounted cash flow element of the event the event fees and and the follow on I mean that's something we've still to get our heads around. And I know there's a lot of operators don't use that model as well. So there's a there's there's quite a variety in terms of how people are um, you know doing these projects I, I think oddly have just been uh, um, Federated Hermes put a 28 and a half million pound line into the oddly group which was based on funding that discounted cash flow and that sort of um, that cash generation that's the first one I think that's happened in the UK so that's really that's quite interesting that they've taken a decision to go down uh, you know feel, feel strong enough to do that but of course oddly is a scale business um, so I think we're still finding our feet uh, what, one of my team actually um, went back to New Zealand to live and now runs the retirement uh, side of the ANZ Bank in New Zealand, far more advanced uh, in New Zealand in terms of its place in the market and its uh, visibility in the market. So he, he's been quite a good source of, of detail, but they're so far ahead of us that their lending market is quite mature. Um, so I think we've got a bit, we've got a bit to go. I think in terms of penetration, I think um, Australia and New Zealand are, are at about the, the highest levels, I think. Um, Stuart, you've got your hand raised. So do you want to come in on that point? Yeah, I just think that's a great point Derek's raised. You know, not only is the lending market for uh, much more mature, it's because the, the audience is much more mature about what it is they're actually buying into. And I think that that, that proves in the returns and the predictability of the returns for the funder. So. Derek, is, is there any stats around about the ROI um, of an IRC compared with other residential use classes? Are they are they broadly comparable? Uh, I don't think they are, but I, it, it, to me, it's different things. I've been in enough um, locations and seen the offerings to know it's a very different thing. So I don't think it would be right to compare it. Um, you know, for us, it's a real estate investment lending proposition. The, the rental model is interesting because that is an ongoing long-term commitment to service debt with your rent uh, income. Um, the sales model is interesting as well because if it all goes um, if it all goes to plan, I, I would expect my lending to be repaid over a reasonably short period of time after the development. Um, but similarly, mixed tenure is something that I think we're seeing emerging. And the last project I did, the optimum of that project was to use an element of sales to repay the senior debt, to leave the property then debt-free, and with the remaining units, either do rent, mixed tenure, or sales. 
so that that operator was then in a position of of having flexibility uh, but they priced it right the the scheme was done in such a way that 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 was proven to be viable uh so you know the, again very different models there's no we, we do a lot of care home developments 65 75 bed they're fairly stock um we know the kind of fill up rates are fairly standard we understand the fee levels that are generally driven from the self-funded market um so in a way they're kind of similar i think ircs are very different just because of such a mix of things so i can't pinpoint you an roi but you know we wouldn't do them if they didn't give us a suitable return yeah do you think we're going to see more then of these more these new kind of funding structures that are, are bespoke to this sector because as you say it is very different from uh, from other types of development i think we have to because of it i don't think if they're not if the funding structures aren't there this this sec, this sector will not develop it will not mature we you need that um you need that ability to raise the capital uh and, and capital can be quite expensive things are very expensive as they are at the moment building land values haven't leveled out build costs have come back slightly but they're still expensive and as i think stuart said you know the, the um the challenge of the cost of the project dictates then how much the units have to be sold for and you can end up sort of slightly out of kilter with your comparable market if you're going to go and compare a three-bedroom flat in battersea with a three-bedroom a uh, two-bedroom irc unit in battersea that it, that becomes quite quite mucky yeah yeah but as you say i mean the, the, the supply demand fundamentals are so strong in this sector and, and you know with the aging population that we've got things are going to have to happen to 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 speed things up you know it, it, absolutely I, I think it's just an understanding in the market generally and in the, in the public's perception as well as to what these what these um what these developments actually provide i think once you've been to see one and you've been you know, you, you experience that um not the property element but everything else that goes with it you can buy into why that could be a good lifestyle choice for a lot of people but i just don't think there's enough of it and I think Lex or Stuart mentioned, you know, we've got the central belt of Scotland, which you'll gather from my accent I am familiar with. Um, I can't point you to any retirement projects in that particular territory. And I think it's the it's the lack of knowledge of it and probably the fear of the price point with regards to the population that have that um that wealth availability. So so there's there's still a lot to educate people. Um on that particular point, I think there's one scheme in Scotland that's been in the press, Och Lochen, which is a sort of almost rural development of scale that's never really got itself into a reasonably good space. Um, so we could do without that as well, frankly. Yeah, yeah. Um, Peter, I saw your hand was raised there, but it's gone again. Did you want to come in on? on... Uh, we've only got five minutes to go, so I'll, 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 I'll rather not take that time up for everyone. Yeah, okay. OK, we have got a question in from um, Paul Rands, which is an interesting one and um, kind of refers to um, definitions. You know, we hear later living, senior living and so on, but a lot of people are still using the term retirement. And Paul asks if that is the problem with people working later and an increasing entrepreneurial self-employed demographic that wish to keep active and earning. Doesn't it need a different marketing pitch for them to relate to? Um, Ali, do you want to kick off on that one? Yeah, sure. And, and I think I'll touch on what, what Lex has put in the comments there, because, yeah, I'm, I'm part of the ARCO network, and I, I believe they did a big piece of research on this, I think, two years ago when they looked at different words and they decided on IRC, um, the best of a, a, a bad bunch. But, yeah, I, I totally hear you. It is, it is a tricky word, retirement in England you know it can go to your 80 90 but yeah Lex do you want to come in if you had any more knowledge of why Arco yeah it, it was the least worst everyone sort of understands what it is you know it has negative connotations retiring from the field of battle and retiring from life 
I uh, understand that, but I think yet, yet again, it's universally understood and recognised that generally post 65, or is it 71 now? Or let's face it, people of my generation are probably never going to retire. Never going to afford to, Lex. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, so yeah, integrated retirement community, and I just I know we've been banding around this IRC term. I think it's very it's very key to understand uh, the difference between retirement housing, which is in truth a sort of a, an apartment complex with a little bit of community space if you were to be slightly sniffy about it you'd say they stick a coffee machine in a reception and say it's a retirement community versus an IRC which is uh, has a lot more communal communal spaces but has passes the litmus test which is this if you get out of bed at three o'clock in the morning and you have a fall who picks you up if you're in an IRC it's on-site CQC registered staff that's the key difference. It's 24 hour on site call and uh, care and support. Um, yeah, it, it, integrated retirement community is integrated with care, integrated with amenities, integrated with facilities. Uh, and, you know, here we all are. I wish we could do a, a kind of a, a, a head count or a little vote here, because even though there's lots of people on this call and we're here to talk about this sector, I would guess that at least 60% of the people listening in today have never actually been into an integrated retirement community, which yeah. speaks volumes. I, I could be way off base here, uh, but it's not a common product, uh, unlike countries uh, like New Zealand, which as we pointed out, they're comfortably 30 years ahead of us. And just, just as a sort of a, a anecdotal aside, of the five biggest house builders in New Zealand, two of them are IRC developers. That's how far. Can you imagine if Persimmon was the largest or, or, or Barclay Homes or someone was the largest uh, uh, IRC developer in the UK? They're, they're years ahead of us. But that, I suspect, is where we are going, which is why this is such an exciting sector. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Peter, did you want to just come in quickly on that? Yeah, it's about hospitality at the end of the day. You know, there's there's an element of what's called marketing myopia here. Yeah, Theodore Levitt, if you're interested in looking that up. Um, he he said, look, you know, um, we don't, you know, railways don't run trains. Their job is to move people around. And if you look at an IRC, is it for retirement or is it about having hospitality with some care uh, in later life? And I think there's a great opportunity for the hospitality sector here. And it's about reframing how you can live later. So retirement is a drag, I think, on the sector as a term, because if it's ne negative connotations, as others have alluded to, and, and back to sort of Derek's point earlier, um, you know, patient capital is something that is a term that, that Michael Arco and many of us that have been to conferences have talked about. Um, if capital wants to, as it does, find its quickest and best return, it's best off in building houses. Uh, perhaps and um, and um, you know buy to rent and uh, and maybe a bit of student still, but um, it's a hospitality pay with long term revenue streams that is probably going to get the most traction. So reframing and avoiding the marketing myopia associated with the word retirement question mark should that be where we're going? Interesting stuff. And I, I know there are quite a few hoteliers and other hospitality professionals. Um, tuned in today so uh, they're obviously thinking along the same lines as you Peter um, thanks everyone that was a really interesting discussion we we, we could go on but we've reached 12 o'clock um, just going to show a couple of quick slides before we finish and then as I said we'll, we'll leave the session open for a couple of minutes so you can take some notes from the chat so our next urban living webinar is taking place a week today they're coming thick and fast uh, and we're in a completely different asset uh, um, use class next week when we're looking at the flex workspace market stepping out we work shadow a really interesting sector actually there's loads going on there um, that webinar is a week today at 11 a.m and if you'd like to register for that one you can see the link in the chat if you'd like to work with us uh, on urban living news or any of our other brands here at ihm whether um, in a digital offer or in person events Get in touch with my colleague Henry, whose details you can see there on the screen and also in the chat. And finally, uh, 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 thank, you. thank you. Thanks ever so much to Commercial Acceleration for sponsoring today and Ali for your participation. Thanks also to Lex, Peter, Stuart, and Derek. 
thanks to you all for watching uh, and, and for submitting your questions. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Have a great weekend. And I'll see you all on another webinar soon, hopefully. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Hello, we are International sure. Hospitality Media, or IHM for short. IHM is the number one brand to engage with decision makers in hospitality and real estate. Our four multimedia brands lead their respective sectors with breaking news, comments, trends and opinion across a variety of multimedia solutions. We provide an inspirational community to connect people through world-class events, webinars, podcasts, award schemes and much more. But let us share our story of who we are and what we do. Over 10 years ago, Piers and George had a light bulb moment to provide expert opinion, comments and low-cost digital content. And so they went on a journey over the past decade, creating media platforms to serve the hospitality and real estate industries. We now have an engaged audience with a reach of over 60,000 monthly visitors across our website, 48,000 of our email database across all the sectors and over 67,000 across our social channels. Everything we do believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. We make things simple and very easy to work with us. And we're a friendly bunch too. We offer creative solutions to help you achieve your business goals. Read, watch, listen, meet with IHM. Contact us for a chat today. Just look at some of the brands we have worked with recently.